On a hot, humid afternoon in September of 1984, a group of local teens wandered into a wooded lot in the village of Lindenhurst, a small suburban community on the southern shore of Long Island. Approaching a local hangout known as the Hut, the boys dropped down into what was little more than a hole dug into the earth and made a horrifying discovery. There, beneath a length of rolled-up carpet, they found the body of 14-year-old Laura Ann Parker. Laura had gone missing four months earlier, but despite the pleas of her parents, neither law enforcement nor the local community had given her much attention. Labeled a runaway, Laura's parents hit roadblock after roadblock trying to get someone, anyone, to help them in their search for their daughter. Then on that sticky September afternoon, they watched in horror as their child's skeletal remains were removed from that hole in the ground, still covered in scraps of the clothing she'd worn the day she disappeared. Despite the realization that Laura had never run away, the wall of silence grew only higher as investigators, suddenly driven to find out what had happened, were rebuffed and dismissed by the community who appeared not only to want nothing to do with the case, but who showed almost no care or concern about the teenager murdered just blocks from the school. For 40 years, the mystery of Laura's death has endured, and for all of that time, those who hold pieces of the puzzle have refused to share them. Had Laura encountered a violent and vicious killer passing through the village in search of his next victim, or had she been lured to that spot and killed by someone she knew, someone from the community, perhaps even someone from her own neighborhood? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 198, The Murder of Laura Ann Parker. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we dive into the disturbing and haunting murder of 14-year-old Laura Ann Parker. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash trace evidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. In May of 1984, Lindenhurst High School freshman Laura Ann Parker mysteriously vanished in the middle of the day. For months, her family fought to get help in finding their little girl, only to be ignored by claims that the teen had chosen to run off. Four months later, when her body was recovered just blocks from the school, investigators struggled to get any information about what may have happened. This is episode 198, The Murder of Laura Ann Parker. New York State is home to nearly 20 million people spread out across 57,000 square miles, making it the fourth most populous state in the country. Of that 20 million, just shy of 8 million, or one-third, live along a 121-mile stretch of fish-shaped land known as Long Island. Were Long Island its own state, it would rank as the 13th most populous. From the eastern end of sparsely populated farmland to the western end's densely populated urban hubs of Brooklyn and Queens, there are a wide variety of lifestyles from city living to sprawling suburban towns, hamlets, and villages. Suffolk County comprises the largest geographic portion of the island, running from East Farmingdale to Montauk and Orient Points. Stretching out over 86 miles in length and 26 miles in width, Suffolk is home to nearly 1.6 million residents and is where I was born and raised. It is suburbia for the most part, countless rows of streets with picturesque homes dotting along every avenue, from the rich areas along the North Shore and out east to the blue-collar communities among the Southern Shore, Long Island is an eclectic mixture of cultures and ethnicities truly defining the melting pot that is New York. Like almost everywhere in the world, each town has its own history and urban legends, 
from the haunted house down the street to the place where a madman once hunted down victims, there are stories going back for hundreds of years about the ghosts of the Revolutionary War to modern-day monsters like the Long Island serial killer. Some stories are true. Others have been so convoluted over time it's difficult to discern fact from fiction, real life from fantasy. The village of Lindenhurst, located along the south shore in the town of Babylon, has its share of mysteries. But one of them is so haunting it not only remains unsolved, it's hardly ever discussed. So many small towns try to conceal the dark details of past events sprinkled throughout their history, and Lindenhurst is no different. Hundreds of thousands of students attend high school on the island, and many of those schools are open campuses, allowing students to leave school property during their lunch break. Lindenhurst High School, however, is not one of them. Students are required to remain on campus throughout the day, and when someone asks why, which happens countless times each school year, they're told the same story. A girl once left for lunch and was murdered, causing the school to change its policy. For many students, they believed it to be little more than a scare tactic, a way for the administration to justify a closed campus because it better suited their needs. As it turns out, however, that is a true story. But getting to the heart of it is vastly more complicated than you'd imagine. Not only was a student murdered after leaving school for lunch, but the community as a whole was involved in placing a dark shroud over that truth. While one family grieved their loss, others turned their backs, not only ignoring the horrors of what had occurred, but actively working to keep the truth from being revealed. It was the summer of 1984, and 14-year-old Laura Parker had been missing for months. Investigators, school employees, and even families in the community turned a blind eye. They dismissed her disappearance as little more than a runaway situation. A rebellious teen looking to punish her parents by escaping from their rule to live life by her own choices. The Suffolk County Police and even the FBI closed their investigations, labeling Laura a runaway and dismissing any speculation to the contrary. Then, one hot September morning, a group of teenagers came upon a grisly scene, the skeletal remains of a young woman hidden beneath a rolled-up carpet in a local hangout. As it turned out, Laura hadn't run off anywhere. She had been killed the day she was reported missing, and for months, nobody seemed to care. Even now, nearly 40 years later, the truth of Laura's fate remains unknown, and those who might possess some answers continue to keep their silence. This is her story, at least as much of it as is known. Laura Ann Parker was born on Saturday, July 26, 1969, and was adopted at birth by James and Patricia Parker. At the time, James was employed as a mechanic for Pan Am Airline, working out of JFK Airport in nearby Queens. The Parkers had previously had one child, a daughter named Kathleen, who had been born with intellectual disabilities, resulting in her necessitating round-the-clock care outside of the home. Following Kathleen's birth, the couple continued to try and have children, though after six difficult and painful miscarriages, they came to believe that they simply couldn't have their own children anymore. As a result of this, they decided that adoption was their best option. From the moment they brought Laura home, the Parkers were completely enamored with the infant. Patricia would later explain to the Daily News, saying, quote, We got Laura when she was only three days old. She was so beautiful, we worried that her mother might want her back. I recall seeing the mother's sister in a department store and rushing off in fear the woman would tell her sister of Laura's beauty. End quote. At the time of Laura's arrival, the Parkers were living in a quaint little neighborhood on South 7th Street in Lindenhurst, a village located on Long Island in Suffolk County. Lindenhurst sits on the southern shore of the island and is part of the town of Babylon. In the 1970s, when Laura was growing up, Lindenhurst was at its peak population with more than 28,000 residents living in the tight space of just 3.8 square miles. It was, in a way, what you might imagine of a television show neighborhood. A lot of young parents raising their kids, getting to know each other through their children's social connections. Block parties, gatherings, backyard barbecues. Many who lived in and grew up around Lindenhurst would describe it as a very tight-knit community where everyone looked out for each other. According to Patricia, 
Laura was a sweet, loving little girl who was highly active throughout her youth and extremely social. She played Little League softball and showed skill and athletic prowess. She loved music and enjoyed singing, dreaming of perhaps one day becoming a famous musician. Patricia explained, quote, Laura was outgoing and friendly and social. She wanted everyone she met to like her, and she liked them in turn. She was always doing little nice things. I remember seeing her pick up the phone and calling Jim at the airport because she just wanted to say hello. She joined the Girl Scouts. She made friends everywhere. She loved to sing and was a member of the St. Boniface Episcopal Church Choir in Lindenhurst. I can still hear her singing in her room. End quote. As Laura grew up, she became more physically active, getting involved in sports and continuing to expand her social experiences through different groups and clubs. In the late 70s, the Parkers discovered that they were not, in fact, incapable of having children, as Patricia would give birth to a son, James Jr. Laura was excited to have a little brother and was active in helping to take care of him. The Parkers were a tight-knit family who loved one another deeply and who spent a lot of their free time together for family nights and group outings. It was, for lack of a better term, seemingly the ideal family. At the age of 14, Laura began attending school at Lindenhurst High School, where she continued her participation in sports and clubs, joining the swim team and the school choir where she was listed as an alto. Beyond that, in her free time, she volunteered for a mental health organization inspired in part by the struggles of her older sister Kathleen, who she adored. All around, it appeared Laura was a popular teen who made friends easily and cared deeply for those she invited into her inner circle. While Laura seemed to excel at physical activities and social networking, if there was one place she fell short, it was in her academic performance. It certainly wasn't due to a lack of intelligence. Laura was a sharp young woman who spoke her mind and followed through on her intentions. According to Patricia, it was more that among the list of things that kept Laura's attention, school was very low on it. She explained, quote, She liked to swim and join the track team in school. Laura could have been a good student, but she had too many interests other than school. Because of her marks, her father said she couldn't date until she was 16. End quote. As I'm sure many parents of teenagers have experienced, banning a child from dating can work, but only for a period of time. Regardless of her grades and her father's reaction to them, Laura didn't remain single for long. In fact, during her freshman year, she began a relationship with a boy one year her junior. Mom and dad weren't exactly in the dark about this, but it wasn't an issue that needed to be directly addressed. Patricia later explained they were aware that Laura was seeing a boy named Michael, and oftentimes when they dropped her off for choir practice and school activities, they knew she was spending time with him under the belief that they were unaware. According to Patricia, Laura was quite serious about Michael, inasmuch as a 14-year-old and 13-year-old can be serious about one another. First love, as we all know, can feel like it's all that matters in that moment. By May of 1984, the end of the school year was approaching, and while Laura hadn't performed very well academically, her parents believed things would improve the next year. At the time, Laura was going through somewhat of a rebellious phase, as most teens do, so her folks weren't too worried as, with teenagers, things could change at any time. Unfortunately, they had no way of knowing that just weeks before the official end of classes, Laura would mysteriously disappear, leading to a summer fraught with pain, grief, desperation, and loss. It was the morning of Wednesday, May 23rd, when Jim awoke to begin his normal morning ritual before heading off to work. Being a mechanic at the airport, Jim's schedule had him arriving at 6 a.m. to begin a long day of working on engines and ensuring that the fleet was running properly. At approximately 5.30 a.m., he walked into Laura's bedroom and woke the 14-year-old. While it was early, Laura liked to be awakened before her dad left for work so she could have time to dry and style her hair. According to Jim, the last time he saw Laura, she was sitting on the edge of her bed, still dressed in her pajamas and rubbing the sleep from her eyes. As he did most mornings, Jim leaned over and kissed her on the forehead, wishing her a good day at school and telling her he'd see her later that night at the dinner table. Jim had been working on adding a deck to the back of the home and completed the work the previous day. 
Before leaving Laura's bedroom that morning, he told the teen that she should make use of that deck and invite some friends over for a party. Excited by the proposition, Laura lit up and told her father that she loved him. Grabbing his gear, Jim strode out of the home and began the 30-minute drive to the airport, never imagining that this would be the last time he'd ever see his beautiful daughter alive. Things were slightly different for Patricia. That morning, she awoke somewhat startled in the midst of a dream that qualifies more as a nightmare. While she couldn't exactly nail down all of the details, she'd later tell Newsday that the nightmare had focused on Laura, and there was this overwhelming feeling that she'd never see her daughter again. Of course, in the moment, no one takes their nightmares all that seriously, and Patricia kicked off the blankets, heading into the kitchen for her morning cup of coffee. By this time, Laura was already well on her way to getting set for school and came bouncing into the kitchen to say goodbye. It was a cool morning on the southern shore, with chilly 20-mile-per-hour winds sweeping up from the Atlantic. Turning her attention towards Laura, Patricia became concerned that the teen might not be appropriately dressed for what was seemingly going to be an unseasonably cold morning. She later detailed her exchange with her daughter, saying, quote, she had on white jeans and a green and white striped tank top with hang 10 on it. I said, it's cool. You better go put something on, end quote. Moments later, Laura threw on her school jacket and called out that she was heading off and Patricia wished her a good day, watching as the teen walked out the front door, purse in hand, for the last time. What had begun as a typical day in the Parker home would, just 12 hours later, transform into every parent's worst nightmare, one which continues to endure nearly 40 years later. According to everything that is known about this day, Laura arrived at school that morning as she usually did, and nothing stood out as being out of the ordinary or strange about her or her behavior. Attending her morning classes, Laura made her way over to her locker before the start of lunch and stowed a handful of items for retrieval later, these being her makeup kit, purse, diary, and reading glasses. She then made her way to lunch where she sat down with her best friend, Anne-Marie Vitale. Telling her about the party her father was allowing her to throw on their new deck, Anne-Marie would later state that Laura was in good spirits that afternoon, describing her as bubbly. Now, there is somewhat of a debate about the last time Laura was seen, though there appears to be more evidence on one side than the other. Several reports of the time stated that Laura was last seen during the final period of classes and disappeared shortly thereafter, missing an after-school practice that she never would have had she any choice about it. However, other reports suggest that the last time anyone actually saw Laura was during this lunch period. At the time, Lindenhurst had an open campus, but in the years after the disappearance, the school would change its policy. This, conjoined with the fact that there don't appear to be any verified sightings of Laura after lunch that day, leads most to believe that she disappeared sometime during the middle of the day. In addition to this, the Suffolk County Police have stated on more than one occasion that the last time Laura was seen by anyone was at approximately 12.10 p.m. In the nearly 40 years that have passed, some former classmates of Laura's have come forward with varying claims about their encounters with her that Wednesday afternoon. Several students have stated that they saw Laura during their lunch break and that she invited them to come with her off campus to hang out for a bit. No one ended up going with the 14-year-old, though, and the last time there's a confirmed sighting of the teen was 10 minutes after noon. She didn't have anything with her at the time, having left most of her stuff in her locker where she planned to grab it later. Sadly, Laura would never make it back to her locker or even the school, and what exactly happened that afternoon remains a mystery to investigators and her family to this day. When Laura didn't arrive home after school that afternoon, there was no immediate reason for concern. She had choir practice, which started 30 minutes after the final bell rang. It wasn't unusual for Laura to arrive home several hours after school ended, usually hanging around to chat with friends after practice. However, when Jim arrived home and dinner hit the table and Laura still wasn't there, her parents began to worry. It wasn't like her to be that late not without so much as a phone call, so they did what most parents would do in that situation. They began making calls to the parents of Laura's friends, asking if their daughter was there, 
but they quickly discovered no one had seen the 14-year-old since that afternoon. When the Parkers called the school, they were informed that Laura hadn't shown up for choir practice either. That one piece of information certified to her parents that something was definitely wrong. Their next call was to the Suffolk County Police Department, where Jim explained the situation and stated that he wanted to file a missing persons report for his daughter. At the time, the police weren't exactly concerned. To them, if a 14-year-old hadn't come home, there were two likely answers. Either she was off with friends and had lost track of time, or she was a runaway and she'd return eventually. Frustrated by this response, Jim wasn't going to give up, and he continued to press the police until they agreed to send some officers out to look for her. Different units were dispatched to different areas, but based on the information gleaned over the years, it doesn't sound like they were exactly searching their hearts out. While some officers went to the school, Others drove around the area, keeping an eye out for Laura, but not doing much beyond that. Continuing to argue against the belief that his daughter had run off, Jim contacted the FBI and requested their involvement in tracking down Laura, who at this point, he believed had to be in some kind of trouble. For their part, the FBI did send an agent to Lindenhurst to conduct interviews and to try and locate the missing teen. By the morning of the next day, Thursday, May 24th, Word of Laura's disappearance had made the rounds. Students whispered and gossiped about the missing girl, and as you'd expect, all manner of stories were spun up from Laura running off with an older man to her being the victim of a vicious murderer. When FBI agent Ralph Iannuzzi arrived at the school, he first spoke to the administration before conducting interviews with students. Over the course of the next few days, both the FBI and the Suffolk County Police spoke with countless students and teenagers from around the area. The vast majority hadn't seen Laura since the previous day, though there were some who made different claims. At least a few students told the FBI agent that they'd seen Laura in the hours and days after her disappearance. In some instances, they reported seeing her around the neighborhood. In others, they claimed to have actually spoken with her saying that Laura told them she'd run away from home and had no intention of coming back. As a result of these interviews, the FBI made the determination that Laura had in fact run away, and therefore, they didn't need to be involved. Agent Ian Newsy later told the Daily News, quote, We entered the case as soon as Laura's disappearance was reported and launched an extensive investigation. We determined that she left home voluntarily based on her being seen several times by friends. We discontinued that investigation. End quote. The FBI were not alone in this point of view, with both the Suffolk County Police and the administration of the high school telling not only Laura's parents, but other students and their parents, that this was not an abduction or a case of foul play, but instead a runaway. As a result, Any searches or efforts to locate the teen were halted, much to the chagrin of the Parkers. James later explained, quote, It's terribly frustrating. Authorities tell me the difference in a runaway and a missing person is the runaway telephones home and says she's all right. We haven't heard from Laura since May. My wife, Patricia, and I take turns being up and down, and some days we overlap. I don't know why she would leave. She flunked several subjects in school, but didn't seem overly distraught. She was very happy on the morning of her disappearance because I had just put the last nail in a patio deck I'd been making and told her to invite some friends over for her party. End quote. As weeks began passing with no sign of Laura nor any contact with her family, the Parkers had to take it upon themselves to try and track down their missing daughter. Due in part to the opinion of law enforcement officials and the school that Laura had run away, The Parkers ran into a lot of roadblocks in their search. Neighbors and friends didn't really participate in searches for the teens, believing she was off on her own and would come back when she pleased. They, too, had heard rumors of Laura being seen around the area and figured that if she wanted to come home, she'd do so in due time. This left the Parkers to do everything themselves. Each new piece of information that came out led the parents to try and track down leads, When local teens claimed to have seen her around, Jim and Patricia would patrol the area looking for her and asking anyone they saw if they'd seen their daughter. 
The family put up flyers bearing Laura's photo and description on every light post and tree throughout Lindenhurst. They spoke to the newspapers, did interviews, fought to get television and radio stations to cover her story, but for the most part, they were dismissed as once reporters spoke to police, they were told it was a runaway situation and nothing to worry about. Frustrated, the Parkers began putting their home number on the flyers rather than contact information for police, believing that they would investigate far better than law enforcement who were essentially ambivalent. At one point in time, the Parkers received a call from a truck driver who claimed to have seen a young woman matching Laura's description, walking the streets of Manhattan. Jim headed out to the city and patrolled the streets for a week, showing pictures of his daughter and trying to track her down. He later told Newsday, quote, I walked the streets in the city for seven days, all night. I walked down streets Charles Bronson wouldn't walk on, end quote. At one point, he spotted someone who looked exactly like his daughter. Sitting in his car, the young woman was walking towards him, and Jim began tensing up, getting ready to grab her, when finally, at the last moment, he realized it wasn't Laura. His heart sunk. That desperate hope in his gut replaced with the intense emptiness and crushed hopes and grief of a parent. He returned home to Long Island, having gotten no closer to finding his daughter, but now wondering just how far she might be, if she was still alive out there somewhere. While putting their home phone number out in the public had resulted in a flood of calls and tips, not one of them was accurate. Each lead either led to a dead end or to a case of mistaken identity. Horrifyingly, some calls were neither flush with tips or information, but instead, were pranks targeting the family. Jim explained, quote, About a month after she was missing, I got a phone call. A girl said, Daddy, will you come and get me? I kept saying, Where are you? Then I heard another girl laughing in the background. End quote. It appeared that teenagers from all across the state thought it was amusing to taunt the grief-stricken parents of a missing girl. While these acts were immature and needlessly cruel, there was another aspect of the case that the Parkers found even more disturbing. While the school and police had told the local community that Laura was a runaway, resulting in most people choosing not to participate in any searches, many of the parents in the area took things a step further. For reasons unknown, they told their children not to cooperate with the police. The kids were told not to speak to them, not to provide them with any information, and when asked, to direct investigators to the parents. Detectives at the time described the local community's involvement as poor, giving them nothing to work with. According to detectives, they were startled by this response, and especially given who some of these people were. For instance, it was reported that Laura's best friend, Anne-Marie Vitali, was amongst those who was instructed not to cooperate, as was her previous boyfriend, Michael. For the Parkers, it was a horrifying nightmare. Not only was their daughter gone, but no one, including people they once considered friends, seemed to give a damn. In desperation, the Parkers announced that they would be offering a $1,000 reward for any information that could lead to their daughter's safe return. Sadly, though, by the middle of July, 60 days after Laura was last seen, calls slowly trickled out, and the Suffolk County Police officially deactivated their investigation. Now, it truly was down to the family, with Jim and Patricia being the only two people actively trying to find Laura. The summer of 1984 was hot and humid on the island, and while many families continued on with their lives, the Parkers were stuck at a standstill. They watched from their windows as neighborhood children got together, hung out and played games, seemingly unaware of Laura's absence. Their support system was weak. Their hearts were broken, and they quickly began to realize that the town they had fallen in love with had turned its back on them. The new school year was set to begin in early September, nearly four months after Laura had last been seen. By this time, while the Parkers continued to hope for the best, they couldn't continue fighting off dark thoughts that invaded their minds. For Laura to have been gone this long... For there to have been no legitimate sightings, no contact, no information, the chances of her still being out there somewhere were between slim and none. 
they began to think of an incident which had occurred a year earlier, one which stood in direct contrast to their experience. A teenager, not much older than Laura, had mysteriously disappeared. The town came together, conducted a long, arduous search, and eventually, they found her. As it turned out, The teen had been abducted by a violent man who moved her to Queens and forced her into sex work. She was rescued from a seedy motel and returned to her family. The Parkers couldn't help but wonder, why had the town rallied around her but chosen to ignore Laura's plight? In a bitter sense of irony, the soap opera General Hospital was in the midst of an explosion of popularity telling the story of Luke and Laura. Attaining ratings that no daytime television show had ever seen before, celebrities were drawn to the show, with Elizabeth Taylor even agreeing to play a part on what was quickly becoming a television phenomenon. Just months before Laura's disappearance, Christopher Cross recorded a song for the show entitled Think of Laura. The song got a ton of airplay, blaring out from radios all over town, yet the meaning was seemingly lost on the population of Lindenhurst, who sang along to the tune, all the while, no one was thinking of the missing Laura Parker, nor the family whose hearts were sinking deeper into grief. Patricia later recalled climbing into her daughter's bed and sobbing herself to sleep, wondering if they would ever find the beautiful girl who had brought so much light into their lives. While they hoped desperately to know the truth, a knock at the door would give them an answer they had been dreading. On the afternoon of Monday, September 10th, Jim stood up from the couch to answer a knock at the front door. Two detectives were standing there and introduced themselves as being from the Suffolk County Police Department. According to Jim, the detectives informed him that they'd found his daughter, and for just a moment, his heart flooded with joy. But that was short-lived. As Jim explained, quote, he said, It doesn't look good, Mr. Parker. Your daughter is dead. End quote. Approximately three miles north of the family's South 7th Avenue home, just a few blocks from the high school where Laura had last been seen, three teenagers had made the grisly discovery. Near the intersection of Monroe Avenue and Frank Street, not far from Breslau Cemetery, there was a wooded plot of land. This area was popular amongst local teens as, a short distance from the roadway, a hole had been dug into the earth. Described as being four and a half feet deep and 11 feet in diameter, this spot was known amongst local teens as the hut. The hole was partially covered over with plywood and allowed kids to hang out inside, out of the view of anyone in the area. Some came to hang out and talk, others smoked cigarettes or marijuana, hanging out into the late night hours. That Monday morning, Three 12-year-old boys had gone into the woods with plans of cleaning out the hut. Once down in the hole, they were tossing pieces of broken wood and empty boxes out when they found a rolled-up length of carpet. Moving to pick the carpet up, they quickly discovered that it was very heavy. Moments later, they saw the remnants of a pink shoe sticking out. Peeling back part of the carpet, the boys saw the unmistakable sight of a human skull. Terrified. They ran screaming from the woods to their homes where they informed their parents of what they'd found. Following the kids back to this hole in the woods, the parents confirmed that this was no story made up by children and quickly dialed 911. When police arrived on the scene, they found the badly decomposed remains of what they believed to be a teenager. Due to the hot, humid weather that summer, little remained outside of a skeleton covered in scraps of clothing. Based on descriptions given by the Parkers, the body appeared to have been wearing the same clothing that Laura had worn to school the day she disappeared. Jim went down to the scene with detectives and witnessed as they carried the body out in what he described as a duffel bag. James explained, quote, He carried it in one hand. How could anyone leave her like that? If they have mirrors in their house, how can they look themselves in the face? How can they keep something like that to themselves? End quote. At the time, they couldn't confirm with 100% certainty that it was Laura. However, circumstantial evidence led them to believe it was. At that time, the Parkers were informed that they would need copies of Laura's dental records in order to confirm her identity. 
John F. Gallagher, chief of detectives for the Suffolk County Police, spoke to the media who had begun gathering in the road just outside of the boundary set by the police tape line. Gallagher told reporters, quote, We're still doing crime scene work, taking sand and soil from below the body. We don't know the cause of death on this youngster yet. The feeling is she may have died of natural causes. From the remains, there is nothing to indicate fractures or anything like that. We'll have to wait for x-rays to see if we can pinpoint anything. End quote. The following day, Tuesday, September 11th, police officially confirmed that the body recovered from the hole was in fact Laura Parker. Due to the high level of decomposition, they couldn't at that time determine a cause of death. However, it was noted that there didn't appear to be severe trauma to the body. No broken bones or fractures, no evidence of knife wounds or gunshots. While this led them to state that the death could have been natural causes, investigators didn't believe this was likely. The fact remained that someone had covered her body with that piece of carpet, which suggested at a minimum that at least one person knew her body was there and had tried to conceal it. Asked by Newsday why police hadn't investigated this case more thoroughly from the get-go, Chief of Detectives Gallagher explained that the FBI had worked the case, and quote, They determined that it was not an abduction, and they called us, and we took it as a missing person. The best we could learn was that she had told friends she was having an argument with her father. End quote. In addition to this, Gallagher noted that multiple teens, allegedly friends of Laura's, had told them that they'd seen her around town in the days and months after her disappearance, leading them to believe that she was a runaway. As it turned out, not one of those sightings was real. In fact, no one had seen Laura Parker since lunch on the day of her disappearance, no one other than the person who killed her. Why they claimed otherwise is another mystery in this case, which has never been answered. The Parkers were devastated to learn that not only was Laura dead, but she had likely been killed. Not only that, she had almost certainly been killed the same day she was reported missing. James spoke to the Daily News, saying, quote, You chase a rainbow, and you think you'll never come to the end. But we did, and Laura's dead. At least now we know. I feel terrible for the parents who have missing kids and never find out. We know, but some of those parents will never know. End quote. On Thursday, September 13th, the Parkers announced in the newspaper that a funeral mass would be held for Laura at St. Boniface Episcopal Church in Lindenhurst, where the teenager would be cremated and her ashes kept in a vault. As for comment during this tremendous time of grief, Jim struggled to find the words, telling the Daily News, quote, put in the story that we loved her, end quote. A small obituary for Laura accompanied the funeral announcement and read in part, quote, Laura Ann, Beloved daughter of James and Patricia, sister of James Jr. and Kathleen, Laura was a member of softball Little League, Girl Scouts, Lindenhurst High School Chorus, Track and Swimming Team, Funeral Mass at St. Boniface Episcopal Church, where Laura served as an acolyte and member of Episcopal Young Churchmen and also sang in the church choir. End quote. At the time, Neither investigators nor the medical examiner were able to determine the cause of death. Examination had yielded few clues, though for detectives working the case as a homicide, there was one common theory. Due to a lack of violence on the remains, there was a likelihood that Laura had died as the result of strangulation or suffocation. Whether or not she had been killed in the hole or deposited there by her killer was unknown, but two details were certain. Someone had known all along exactly where she was, and that person left the 14-year-old lifeless, face down in the dirt, with a carpet thrown over top of her. Investigators didn't believe she had fallen into the hole, but had been placed due to the positioning of her body with one of her arms behind her back. Detectives previously disinterested in the case, dismissing it as a runaway situation, were now focused on trying to find out what had happened to Laura. This was, in a sense, a slap in the face to the Parkers, who had spent four months trying to get police off their asses, only to be dismissed as the parents of a runaway teen. 
there was no joy or pride to be found in having been proved right. And while there must have been great animosity towards both the Suffolk County Police and the FBI, the Parkers didn't speak ill of investigators, hoping now that they might find the answers and bring justice to whoever had taken their beautiful daughter from them. Investigators, though, hit the same brick wall they'd encountered early on. No one would talk. Not parents, not teenagers. No one seemed to want to get involved. If indeed they believed Laura had simply run away, that's one thing. But now the body of a 14-year-old teen has been found in the middle of their community, and still, nobody cares. It was as if Laura's life didn't matter to anyone but her family. As a result, the investigation quickly grew cold. While the Parkers had hoped for answers, they watched bitterly as days turned to weeks, weeks to months, and months to years. The Parkers left Lindenhurst not long after the discovery of Laura's body, finding it too painful to drive down the streets they'd watched her grow up on and feeling betrayed by people they once believed were friends and neighbors. Packing up their belongings, they headed further east on the island, settling into a condo in the hamlet of Hallbrook. Two years later, in 1986, Laura's cold case was among those up for review and was ultimately assigned to two homicide investigators with connections to the area. Detectives Carmody and Faltzgraf had both attended Lindenhurst High School. They'd been with the Suffolk County Police Department for a combined 38 years, six of which had been spent working homicides. Both were married men with children Laura's age, and they took the case personally, wanting to find answers for the family and for their community. Even two years later, though, Carmody and Faltzgraf ran into the same issues their predecessors had. No one wanted to talk about the case, and no one wanted to get involved. In January of 1987, both detectives approached the Daily News and requested that they write a piece about Laura's unsolved murder. Both men expressed their frustrations with the investigation and the lack of cooperation. Asked about Laura's friends and those closest to her, Detective Faltzgraf explained, quote, The Vitali family won't allow us to talk to Anne Marie, and Michael, once cooperative, won't speak to us anymore. End quote. While I can't comment on Anne Marie's cooperation or lack thereof, I did come across several posts from Michael. According to him, he was 13 years old when he dated Laura and had no idea what had happened to her. Michael said that he and Laura had broken up a few weeks prior to her disappearance, but he couldn't remember exactly why, saying it was probably typical teenage drama. When Michael was accused of not cooperating with police, he responded by noting that he had cooperated. He'd told investigators everything he knew. But as time went on, following the discovery of Laura's body, investigators had become more aggressive with him. He said that they frequently showed up at school and pulled him out of class, questioning him without his parents present. For him, the final straw came one day when they showed up at his house and interrogated him on the front porch, accusing him of murder and trying to threaten him into confessing. At least, that's how he and his family saw it, and given the circumstances, it's hard to blame them. Asked their thoughts on the case, Faltzgraf and Carmody had two slightly different theories on what might have happened. Neither believed it was a robbery gone wrong as, when found, Laura was still wearing her rings and a gold chain. While Carmody was a little more protective of his thoughts, Faltzgraf was open to sharing, telling the Daily News, quote, The length of time the body was in the hole eliminated leads. The position of the body, with the face in the dirt and an arm bent behind, indicates to me that she was suffocated at the scene. The reason, however, is unknown. It might have been a sexual encounter, although Laura's clothing, including her underwear, were intact. Why do people kill people? Sex? Drugs? Robbery? We have no evidence of any of these. End quote. For his part, Carmody wasn't sure about the cause of death, and while he acknowledged suffocation was possible, he didn't want to comment without knowing for certain. He did, however, explain that neither detective could wrap their heads around the lack of cooperation, saying that it was, quote, mind-boggling not being able to find people who will tell us what happened. Somebody must know somebody who knows what happened, end quote. At the time, there were rumors circulating about Laura. 
It seemed while no one really wanted to talk or cooperate or assist investigators in solving her murder, they were more than happy to speculate about her personality and behaviors. Multiple people reported that she was a smoker, this character flaw in their mindset seemingly being enough not to care about her death. Others mentioned drugs that Laura was involved in using and hung around drug dealers. This struck her parents as odd as they hadn't experienced anything with Laura to indicate that she had any kind of a drug problem. She had apparently admitted to her parents that she'd smoked a joint once, but there were no indications that it had gone any further than that. Regardless, there were rumors that the teen had gotten into heavier drugs and may have died due to an overdose leading someone to cover her up with a rug and leave her there. These rumors would later be dismissed when a forensic examination of her bone marrow concluded that there were no traces of drugs in her system at the time of her death. Completing the interview, Detective Carmody asked the community to help with information. He stated, quote, We appeal to the public for help from a moral standpoint. Laura Ann's parents are going through a living hell not knowing what happened to their daughter. We can't supply an answer at this point. We still don't know if it was actual murder, since no vital organs remained. What we are asking is, if anyone knew what happened to Laura Ann, please come forward and tell us. If someone reading this killed her, well, call us and talk to us. Get it off your chest. If it was accidental, we can close the case and satisfy the parents. It's a terrible thing to not know what happened to your kid. It's worse than torture. End quote. Unfortunately, it seems, no one was willing to come forward with any information, or at least if they did, it didn't assist investigators in finding the answers they sought. Another year passed when, in February of 1988, both the Parkers and Detectives Carmody and Faltzgraf again went to the newspapers in hopes of drumming up some leads. Speaking to Newsday, Detective Carmody revealed a few new pieces of information. He stated, quote, we believe she was murdered the same day she disappeared. If she was a murder victim, we believe the murderer was someone known to her. The killer probably was from the neighborhood. All we have is, she's found in this hole and she's covered up with a carpet, so we don't know how she died. We aren't ruling out that she was strangled or smothered. End quote. Carmody went on to explain that, given the isolated location in which the body had been found and the lack of any sightings of transients or strangers in the area, there was a high likelihood that Laura had been killed by someone she knew, someone who lived in the area and probably still lived there. For the community in Lindenhurst, however, if they knew who had taken Laura's life, they still weren't talking. Her case once again grew cold. A year later, in May of 1989, the Parkers, along with Detectives Carmody and Faltzgraf, embarked upon a new endeavor. It had been five long years since Laura's body had been pulled from the hole in the woods and the answers were still fleeting. Had Laura lived, she was set to have graduated from Lindenhurst High School in the spring of 1987, two years earlier. Detectives and the family hoped that the passage of time might have changed some people's perspectives, that maybe information they might possess would have been weighing on them. In hopes of applying pressure to those emotions, the group wrote and mailed letters to 1,000 of Laura's classmates who would have graduated in 1987. As Carmody explained, quote, The letter is trying to get some sympathy. We never give up on looking for new information. End quote. Once again, however, investigators were given the cold shoulder. It seemed the more time passed, the less anyone was interested in revisiting this horrible crime. The last major piece of media coverage available in Laura's case came in May of 1991, marking seven years since she had disappeared. If alive, she would have been turning 21 years old that summer, but instead of celebrating her entrance into the world of full adulthood, the Parkers had only the bitter grief of wondering what might have been. Patricia, speaking to Newsday, expressed her pain and frustration with her former community and their lack of interest in helping to bring her daughter's killer to justice. She stated, quote, This is your hometown. Something has happened to a young girl, and people say, Let her rest in peace. Let her rest in peace. There's questions that have to be answered so she can rest in peace. End quote. In the living room of the family home, 
They keep a large framed photo of Laura, and they look at it every day, seeing the smiling face of the beautiful daughter they still miss so desperately. Upstairs in their bedroom, they kept a gold ring with a pearl setting. It was a gift from Jim to his daughter, and was found on her body that horrible day in September of 1984. Seven long years later, the Parkers still didn't know for certain how their daughter had been killed, nor why someone would have done this to her. Even for investigators, the mystery is strong enough that her case was not officially classified as a homicide, but as a suspicious death. They know, however, that somewhere out there, someone, and likely more than one person, know exactly what happened to Laura Ann Parker that May afternoon when she walked off campus and never came back. Asked about the family and their search for truth, Detective Robert Doyle told Newsday, quote, They are stuck in the stage where there is no light at the end of the tunnel. The victim's pain is over. The victim is dead. It's the victim's family that goes through an immeasurable amount of pain with the constant waiting for an arrest. End quote. As the years have gone on, not much has changed in the investigation. The mystery of Laura's death is as unexplained as it was nearly 40 years ago when her body was pulled from that hole in the earth. Her parents never stopped fighting to find answers and justice. Sadly, James passed away in 2001, having lived the last 17 years of his life hoping to one day know the truth. For Patricia, the fight went on, but she too has now passed on, never knowing what happened to her beloved daughter, nor why someone would have done something so terrible to such a sweet, loving, and kind young woman. Asked about the pain after all those years, Patricia told reporters, quote, Sometimes I have mixed emotions about finding out what happened. If she died horribly from suffocation or something like that, then I don't want to hear it. I miss her terribly, and she was in my thoughts throughout Christmas and New Year's. I'm also tired. I had her and lost her. I know my husband will never rest until he knows what happened and why. I don't think drugs were involved, but if they were, what kind of a friend would leave my daughter if she was unconscious? I know my daughter would never leave them. End quote. When last seen, Laura Ann Parker was described as being a white female with sandy blonde hair and blue eyes standing 5 feet 2 inches tall and weighing approximately 120 pounds. She was last seen around 12.10 p.m. on the afternoon of Wednesday, May 23, 1984, leaving the campus of Lindenhurst High School. At the time of her disappearance, she was wearing white jeans and a green and white striped tank top with the words Hang 10 on it. She was also wearing a Lindenhurst High School jacket and pink running shoes. Her remains were discovered four months later on September 10th in a local hangout in the woods known as the Hut. Little more than a hole in the ground, Laura's body was found beneath a piece of rolled-up carpet. She was face down, with one of her arms behind her back. Though her clothes had partially worn away, there was enough to confirm it was the same outfit she'd worn the day she went missing. Due to the level of decomposition, a cause of death has never been determined. However, given that she had been covered up with the carpet, investigators believe that her death was suspicious and was either accidental or the result of foul play, perhaps via strangulation or suffocation. For years after Laura's death, her parents published memorials to her in local newspapers on the bitter anniversary of the day she went missing. They wished to express their love for her and their hope that someone would come forward with what they knew. Asked about the loss of his daughter in the years prior to his passing, James Parker spoke through painful sobs, telling reporters of the life that was stolen, the light that was extinguished, and of the dreams gone unfulfilled, saying, quote, Something was taken from us that can never be replaced. We went to a friend's daughter's wedding, and it hurt very much. When I followed my daughter down the aisle, it was behind her casket, and not as the father of the bride. It's every parent's worst nightmare. Your loving, beautiful child heads off for another day at school and never comes home. 
For months, you endure the pain and grief of searching for her, only to have your world come crashing down when her body is found. In the midst of the horror, you set out to lay your beloved child to rest, then turn your attention towards finding the answers. Why did this happen? Who did it? And will they ever pay the price? So many families have gone through this, and while many have found answers, and some have received justice, nothing can ever fill the hole in their hearts left behind by the loss of a child. Of course, this case is a little different, isn't it? From the get-go, the Parkers had to fight to get anyone to help them. The police were dismissive. She's just a runaway, so she's not worth their time. The FBI asked some questions, got told she's been seen in the area, and figure, hey, this doesn't require our attention. I mean, what are the chances some local teens might not be telling the whole truth, right? Don't even get me started on the community. I don't know what was wrong with these people, but to turn your back on friends and neighbors, to disregard the pain and loss of a family, and to instruct your children not to cooperate, that's a level of madness I can't even begin to wrap my head around. James and Patricia Parker already had the weight of the world on their shoulders. Their daughter was gone, but no one seemed to care. No one believed them when they said their daughter wouldn't just run away. Nobody cared when they begged for help or information. Instead, they had the police, the school, and their own community turning their backs on them. They were abandoned by people who had spent time with their daughter, been in their home, shared barbecues and birthday parties. Not only did they lose their child, They lost their idea of what their lives were. In the end, they fought for the truth alone. They drove the streets, put up flyers, followed up on every tip. They dealt with liars, pranksters, people seeking a cash grab and investigators who couldn't be bothered to actually go out and look. I know we've covered this in past episodes, how police were so quick to just dismiss missing teenagers as runaways, but why does that make them unworthy of finding? Laura was 14 years old when she disappeared, and the basic response was, well, she'll come back when she wants to. I'm sorry, but that's absolutely unacceptable. Maybe we might be able to look back with hindsight and figure cops just didn't know any better, or that's just the way things were, but at some point that stops being an excuse, especially when you consider that stuff like that still happens today. In the end, After a long, hot summer filled with dashed hopes and exhaustive searches, there came the knock at the door the Parkers had been dreading. They'd found Laura, and she was dead, just three miles from her home and mere blocks from the high school where she was last seen. In the middle of the woods, in a hole dug into the ground where local teens used to gather. She'd been there since the day she disappeared, the climate of a Long Island summer wearing away her body until only a skeleton wrapped in scraps of clothing remained. Decomposition was so extensive that by the time she was found, the medical examiner couldn't determine a cause of death. As a result, her case isn't listed as a homicide. However, given that someone had hidden her body beneath a roll of carpet, it seemed apparent someone out there knew Laura was dead and continued on that summer as if nothing had happened. For four long months, she lingered there, face down in the dirt, her arm twisted behind her back. Nobody tried to help. Nobody picked up the phone and left an anonymous message. Nobody did anything. It seemed like, despite the concern most communities would feel at the disappearance of a teenager, Laura's case didn't garner any care. One year earlier, the same community had banded together to find a missing teen, and they'd succeeded. She came home. Her abductor was brought to justice. But when it came time to rally the troops for Laura, nobody was interested. How anyone can show such callous indifference is beyond my ability to comprehend. As Patricia said, this was their community. It could have been any of their kids. But because it wasn't, they didn't want to get involved. To this day, if you go out and look for posts about Laura's case, and they are out there, You'll find comments from people who lived in the area at the time, people who knew her, people who went to school with her. Some expressed their sadness and hope the answers are found. Others expressed their surprise. They'd never heard the story. They'd never heard Laura's name before. There are no memorials to the 14-year-old, no plaques on park benches, no streets named after her, no dedication in her own high school yearbook. It's as if nobody wanted to address it. No one wanted to think about it. No one wanted to remember it. What kind of people are these? Then, 
There are the other folks, the ones who pushed the envelope to just shy of blaming Laura for what happened to her. I've seen people say, well, she was a smoker, and well, she was a troublemaker, or she was so rebellious, as if any of those are justifications for a 14-year-old being murdered, left in the dirt, and covered with an old piece of carpet. Laura told her mother she tried smoking marijuana once. Well, hell, I guess she deserved it then, right? She was 14 years old. She had her whole life in front of her until someone stole it away and people act like it's no big deal. Even 40 years later, nobody's come forward. No one's told the police what they know. Sure, people will gossip about it. They'll talk about what they heard from so-and-so. They'll speculate about who it might have been. They'll reference random people in the community. But apparently, nobody who actually has solid information wants to talk to the police. After all these years, does it not weigh on you anymore? Is it just a bad dream you brush away from your memories with disregard? I could go on for hours about how I feel about these people, the FBI, the original investigators, but I'd rather not ramble on a stream of obscenities and insults because what difference is that going to make now? So let's turn our attention towards the differing theories in this case. And yes, despite the absolute void of coverage on it and the town seeming disinterest about Laura, there's a couple. As is often the case when someone is killed or abducted from a close, tight-knit, quiet community, the first thought was this had to be from someone else, someone passing through, someone who worked in the area but didn't live there. I mean, it couldn't possibly have been someone from the area or someone who knew Laura, right? That would just be absurd. It would almost be like believing the community would just ignore the whole situation altogether. When it comes to the stranger theory, a lot of people believe there may have been a serial killer active on Long Island during the mid-1980s. They point to a series of unsolved cases surrounding Laura's. In June of 1984, just one month after Laura's disappearance, 15-year-old Kelly Morrissey vanished from the town of Lynbrook, 20 miles west of Lindenhurst. Five months later in November, two months after Laura's body had been found, Kelly's friend Teresa Fusco disappeared after leaving her job at a Lindbrook roller rink. One month later, her nude body was found in a wooded area covered by leaves and debris. Four months later in March of 1985, 19-year-old Jacqueline Martarella vanished after leaving her Oceanside home to go to her job. Oceanside is a neighbor to Lindbrook and is just under 20 miles west of Lindenhurst. One month later in April, Jacqueline's body was found near a local golf course. She was nude, and while decomposition was extensive, it was ultimately determined that she had been strangled. Many believe there has to be a link between these cases, with some noting that there may have been a killer active in the area, perhaps someone who knew or had been around Kelly and Teresa, as the two were friends and knew a lot of the same people. Plus, they'd vanished not far from one another. That's certainly a possibility. Of course, these days, with the Long Island serial killer being so preeminent in the minds of armchair detectives and online sleuths, many believe it has to be connected to Lisk. This I find frustrating. As someone who was born and raised on Long Island, there are certainly high chances more than one serial killer was active at any given time in a population of nearly 8 million people, but I digress. Not to mention, Lisk wasn't active until years later, as far as we know. The thing about these cases is they certainly appear to be possibly connected. The question is whether or not they have any connection to Laura. Laura disappeared in the middle of the school day and was found four months later just blocks away. She wasn't nude, there was nothing to indicate sexual assault, and she wasn't found in a public area where she'd be easily located. Instead, her skeletal remains were recovered from a hole in the ground where local teenagers hung out. The only question that remains is, Is that where she was killed, or is that merely where she was placed after being killed? I certainly don't believe we can rule out the possibility that this could have been a random crime, perhaps conducted by a serial killer, maybe by some sick bastard passing through who happened to lay eyes on the 14-year-old that afternoon. The thing about it is, though, most of the evidence seems to indicate someone from the local community. This wasn't a spot you'd just stumble upon passing through town. You need to know it's there, or you'd have to be looking to dispose of a body in a small wooded lot in the middle of a neighborhood in broad daylight, assuming no one was going to see you. While it's entirely possible Laura's case is linked to others, 
Neither investigators nor her family believe this to be the case. So that turns our attention back towards Lindenhurst, and as a result, someone who may have known Laura, or at least lived in the same area and knew about the teen hangout. Just for the record, by the way, I've seen a lot of people saying that it's odd that kids were hanging out in a hole in the woods. Maybe it is, but as someone who grew up on Long Island, I did this as a teenager too. Not the same place. I didn't live in Lindenhurst, but maybe it's just a Long Island thing. You dig a hole in the woods, and you hang out with your friends, and no one driving by is the wiser. Anyway, let's move on. So the first person to look at is Michael, who had dated Laura in the months leading up to her death. Michael was 13 years old when he began dating Laura, and while that doesn't rule him out as a potential suspect, I think if we're talking about someone either smothering or manually strangling Laura, it's a little difficult to believe he would have had the strength necessary to do it and to have walked away unscathed. Despite what movies and TV might show you, killing someone in that way is not easy. Laura would have been fighting for her life with every ounce of strength she had, and while it isn't impossible, it does seem a little bit unlikely. Not to mention, how well do you believe a scared 13-year-old boy would hold up to questioning by seasoned homicide investigators? A Reddit user who's done extensive research into this case and who's originally from Lindenhurst went the extra mile and managed to track down Michael and interview him more than 30 years later. According to her, he was very open about the relationship between the two, which he described as typically innocent teenager stuff. They held hands, they kissed, but it didn't go beyond that. According to him, the couple had broken up about a month or so before Laura went missing. It wasn't a bitter breakup, it was just one of those things that happen between teenagers. They're young, they don't know what they want, and while some things come together, others fall apart. I reached out to this poster, who you can find under the Reddit name Betty Davis Midler. She's determined to try and expose this case to more light and to hopefully help bring answers to the family. In her opinion, Michael was honest with her and didn't seem like he was trying to hide anything. Now, I managed to find a post from Michael, and I want to read it to you. It was in a thread where a lot of people were throwing accusations around, and this was how he responded. Quote, I can guarantee it was not her boyfriend, Mike, who was in junior high at the time, and he was thoroughly investigated, including being pulled from class and interviewed on a daily basis without a parent present, and was routinely harassed on his own front porch by very aggressive detectives. It was, to this day, the worst six months of his life. He didn't even go to her funeral because he was too afraid. He was only 13 years old and had no idea what to make of the whirlwind his life became. Maybe next time, don't speak to things you don't know. That being said, I hope they find the person responsible and he spends a long time in prison. End quote. I do think it's worth noting that at no time has Michael been named a suspect by investigators, nor has he been named a person of interest. It appears at the time, he was the best avenue investigators had, or at least the best avenue they believed they had. So, let's take a moment to look at Alex. This guy's name has come up time and time again in my research for this case. Multiple people have stated in online postings that this is the person they've always believed killed Laura. He has a record for drugs, having been busted in possession with intent to distribute while at a playground of all places, apparently leading to his expulsion from school. Beyond that, I found records of him being arrested for several DUIs. In at least one instance, he was arrested while attending a club that was selling alcohol without a liquor license. Basically, if you dig around enough, You'll find that this guy was generally considered a terrible person who was always in trouble with the law, was physically violent, and supposedly had assaulted a young woman a week prior to Laura's disappearance. At the time of Laura's disappearance, this guy lived less than one mile from the location in which her body was found, on Farmers Avenue. Obviously, the opinions of people who are not legally connected to the case nor in possession of any actual evidence can't be weighed that heavily, but I do find it fascinating that everyone seems to speak freely and openly about this guy being their suspect. But there's never been any major follow-up. Now, for their part, I imagine investigators are highly aware of this guy and the rumors surrounding him. But if they did dig into him, then they never managed to find enough to file charges or make an arrest. 
Also, it's worth pointing out that Alex is no longer alive to be questioned further. He passed away in 2005 after a long bout with alcoholism. The only reason I've elected not to use his real name is because he has a family out there, and since he was never named as a suspect, I don't want to bring undue prejudice to them since he is not here to answer for himself. Outside of the possibility that Laura was intentionally murdered, police have considered that this could have all been a terribly tragic accident. Maybe Laura and someone else were roughhousing and things went too far, or someone was looking to bully the 14-year-old and it turned violent. Unfortunately, it's almost impossible to know given the evidence and information available. Given that the body was covered with carpet, there's no doubt that someone knew she was dead and tried to hide it. Whether or not that suggests fear, shame, or malice is a question I'm not qualified to answer. So that essentially brings us to the end of the most prominent theories, but there is one thing I'd like to address. Laura was lying dead in that hole in the woods for nearly four months by the time she was found. Long Island summers are hot. They're humid. Living there, we used to joke that it was like waking up in a glass of warm water every day. Hazy gray skies, intense heat, and as soon as you walk out the door, you were coated with the salty, sticky ocean air. This hole in the woods was a local hangout. They called it the hut. What I struggle to understand about this case, among many other things, is how in the hell did no one find her sooner? The smell of decomposition is unlike anything else. It's not a smell you're simply going to tolerate or ignore. It's overwhelming, especially if you're sitting in this hole with your friends and less than 11 feet away is a rotting corpse. How is it possible that none of these kids knew something was wrong? How did they not find her sooner? It sounds almost like for that entire summer, people avoided that spot. And I can't help but wonder, did they avoid it because of the smell or because they'd heard rumors there was a dead body there? If it was the latter, it's really difficult to understand how no one, no parent, no child, no teen checked it out. Nobody called police. Nobody did anything. So we're supposed to believe that all of a sudden, this hangout spot that all the teens knew about was just abandoned for seemingly no reason? That's a hell of a coincidence. Just last month marked 38 years since Laura Ann Parker went missing while on her lunch break at Lindenhurst High School. The sandy-haired, blue-eyed teen strode off campus and never returned. Four months later, her skeletal remains were recovered from a hole in the woods just a few blocks from the school. In a town where most people knew one another, where people talked, where rumors and gossip were abundant, how is it possible that no one knows what happened here? The more you analyze it, the deeper you dig, the more it seems likely that people knew or had a pretty good idea. Maybe they'd heard a rumor, maybe they chalked it up to boasting or tough talk, but the sheer fact that no one, even all these years later, has come forward with additional information is not only a slap in the face to Laura, but to her family and an entire community. I've covered a lot of cases on trace evidence. Some seem solvable, others appear nearly impossible. This has got to be one of, if not the most solvable case I've ever addressed. And guess what? It's the one that was the most difficult to research. I was born on Long Island. I lived there for 25 years. I've been to Lindenhurst. I was friends with people who went to that high school, and I didn't hear about this case for the first time until a few years ago. Maybe if more people were willing to talk about Laura, there'd be some hope of seeing her case solved. Maybe if her death wasn't hidden away and ignored as if it didn't matter, justice could finally be delivered. Pick up the phone, make a call, send in an anonymous tip, text Crime Stoppers, just do something. Hasn't it been long enough? Unfortunately, without new evidence, an outright confession, or someone coming forward, the murder of Laura Ann Parker will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the murder of Laura Ann Parker, the New York Daily News and Newsday have the most extensive coverage. I also highly recommend checking out the write-ups by Betty Davis Midler on Reddit. She's done a very comprehensive job and provided a lot of insight into this case for me. 
I want to give her a special thank you for chatting with me about the case. If you have any information about the murder of Laura Ann Parker, please contact the Suffolk County Police Department at 631-854-8100. You can also contact Suffolk County Crime Stoppers at 1-800-220-TIPS. That's 1-800-220-8477. If you don't want to make a phone call, you can text the word SCPD to CRIMES. That's SCPD to 274-637. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod. Message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod. Email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. Trace evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers, Alicia Lorraine, Anne Bertram, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Buttram, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eloan Meyer, Eric Sumter, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jen Treb, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkwitz, Julie Mangano, Cara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B., Marla Wright, Melissa Brakaisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levenin, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Adorable Susie Summers, Taylor, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or go to trace evidence.com and click on the support option. This completes our look into the unsolved murder of 14 year old Laura Ann Parker. I want to thank you all for listening and I want to announce that I'm going to be taking next week off. So there won't be an episode next week, just a heads up. So thank you again for listening. And I hope you'll join me next time for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.